Okay, I think we are ready. Good morning. I'm happy to introduce Giovanni Alberti. He will be speaking about on the extension of Frobenius theorem to no smooth sets and currents. Grazie. Okay. So now the file is there, so I think that I can deliver a talk. Okay, so let me thank the organizers for the invitation on this wonderful occasion. And then I guess here comes the difficult part for me. So, Alessio, what shall I say? I heard many people saying how impressive it was meeting you when you were a young graduate student. And I thought for myself, well, such amateurs. I had this impression already when you were in the second year. So really, <laughs> it started much earlier than that, I think. Now, seriously, I think um, uh, what happened made me extremely proud, even if I know I mean, that I have no specific merit in this, in your achievement. I wish I had, but I know that the merits are only yours. And then I think um, I also wanted to add something, not for you, but for the young people around here, since I'm responsible of uh, the graduate program. Now I felt that from time to time I must say something to fulfill my position. And the something that I want to say is the following. And uh, if you want to, to take Alessia and make an example of him, that's not completely clear what that means. I mean, you cannot simply say to people that they should be brilliant or fast or deep. Uh, that's not, I mean, everybody wished to be that, but that's not a suggestion, right? But there is something for which he should be taken as an example. And that's, uh, and that has nothing to do with being brilliant. It has something to do, as already Luigi said, about uh, the way he approached mathematics in a whole. So I remember when he was in the third year, he was studying more or less, I think, all the analysis courses that were around. He was taking interest into that, I think. Uh, what happened somehow that, as far as I remember, he was considering all possible type of analysis at least. I don't know if you studied also algebraic geometry in that way. Maybe not. But so you have limits after all. But uh, I remember at that time, I thought, okay, that's the way of doing it. You study many things, you try a lot of things, and you move a lot to find new things to, to learn, new things to study, new things to... Um, explore. And I think this is this idea that you should see many things. It's somehow fundamental. So you must have the uh, wish to, to learn a lot, study a lot. Okay, so we say usually there is this sentence very much repeated that you do science on the shoulders of giants. Yeah? Well, first you have to climb up there. And secondly, giants is plural. You don't study just one thing. You study several. Now, this may seem that I'm preaching the young people, and that's exactly what I'm doing, by the way. But uh, remember that when I, he was in the third year, I really thought he was teaching me a lesson. Okay. Because I ne was never able to do anything like this as I should have done. And I mean, I really thought, okay, this kid is really <laughs> showing me how to do mathematics. Good. <laughs> okay. So um, I guess this is enough for the for the difficult part, and let's pass to the, to the talk. So, um, here is the title, and what I'm going to talk about is joint work with several people, which started, actually, it's a research that started a few years ago. And the, the people, as you can see, are Annalisa Massacesi, now in Verona, Andrea Merlo, who's a student in the Scuola Normale, and Evgeny Stepanov. Um, okay, so here is the summary. Uh, first, I will, I think it's a good idea to start with the review of what Frobenius theorem is, just to explain. Otherwise, you guess many people might miss the point of the rest of the talk. And then somehow I, cons I will try to explain which extension of Frobenius we consider, nam namely subsets of regular surfaces and currents. Okay, um, so there is a disclaimer. I will tell everything in uh, whatever I say is in dimension three, 
and I'm talking about distribution of planes, I mean really two-dimensional planes in dimension three. And the reason is that in some sense all results concerning Frobenius theorem, almost all, let's say, are fully meaningful in this case, that is, there is nothing more to learn from a more general statement. But whatever we could prove, we proved actually for distribution of K planes in Rn. And also, since these results are local, are on the local structure of these sets and currents, well, the fact that you are in Rn doesn't play any role. I think an n-dimensional Riemannian manifold works as well. And in fact, even less, because in the end, we use the Riemannian structure only to define the Hausdorff measure and dimension, and uh, so Finsler would be enough. I mean, it, the result does not really depend on the metric, okay? Because Frobenius theorem does not depend on the metric. Okay, so basic terminology. Well, in the rest of the talk, will be, will be a distribution of planes in the space. Means that at every point x in the space, you associate v of x, which is a plane. Okay? And then we say that the surface, I mean two-dimensional surface of class C1 is tangent to V if uh, at the points of the surface, the tangent to the surface is exactly V. So no surprise. Um, what is a contact set of a surface? Well, if the surface is not tangent to V, still there might be a subset where it is tangent and such a subset we call a contact set. Okay, and then I will assume that V is actually spanned by two vector fields of class C1. Uh, by the way, of course, again, since statements are local, this restriction is not, uh, this assumption is not restrictive. Okay, and uh, okay, last things you must have in mind is the commutator of two vector fields. This is the formula. Okay, so if you have two vector fields, V1 and V2, the commutator is a vector field. At the point x, this vector field is obtained by deriving the first vector field in the direction of the second one and taking away the derivative of the second vector field with respect to the first one. Or maybe there is a sign which is wrong. Well, never mind. I mean, the only question about commutators is whether they are zero or not, so the sign of the commutator. Okay, so this is uh, the commutator. And uh, we say that um, distribution of plane is involutive, let's say at a point x if this commutator belongs to the plane V of x. So if the two vector fields spanning the distribution of planes actually have a commutator which lies in the plane itself. Okay. And we say that V is non-involutive means that uh, it's not involutive at any point. Okay. So that the commutators so it's, okay. So then the question becomes for which V, distribution of planes, can I find a surface tangent to V? And the answer is Frobenius theorem, okay? The classical one, which has two implications. The first one says that if V is involutive, this is the key point, uh, then uh, the space can be locally foliated by surfaces tangent to V, okay? So I can write any neighborhood of any, um, sorry, I write, for every point I can find a neighborhood which can be written as union of surfaces uh, tangent to V. Actually, it's more precise. I mean, this uh, union of surfaces will be level curves of, uh, level surfaces of a function F with gradient different than zero. So they are not only smooth, but organized, nicely organized. And the vice versa of Frobenius theorem there says that if V is not involutive, then you can find no surface tangent, no surface which is tangent to V. Okay, okay, in this talk I will focus mostly on the second part of the statement. Okay, so this fact that if V is non involutive in general, you don't find surfaces tangent to V. And okay, the second part of the statement it holds for surfaces of class C1. That's easy. Even uh, Lipschitz surfaces, that's a matter of approximation. Okay. And the question is, okay, does it hold for weaker notion of surfaces? So we can somehow consider many different notion of surfaces which are weaker than surface of class E1. And that's what I will explore. And ask yourself, well, does such a surface, if such a surface, can such a surface be tangent to a non-involutive vector field, distribution of planes? Okay, 
And this question has been studied by many authors. Uh, let me just, uh, now I know I'm being unfair, but let me uh, now just write um, two names, namely uh, Zoltan Balog and Valentino Magnani. Um, okay, they didn't write their papers alone. They wrote papers with other co-authors. And I'm unfair in that I'm not writing the name of the co-authors. I'm just writing those names. Okay, sorry. So other people were involved. But let's say that these were the two persons that were leading this kind of research, I would say. Um, so, but before going to the extension of Frobenius theorem, let me explain very quickly, which maybe is the case, what's the idea behind the proof of Frobenius theorem? Why the commutators of the vector field plays a role? Of course, if you already know that, uh, you can skip it, but. Okay, so let's say you want to obtain a surface um, which is tangent to this distribution of planes in the, in the space, right? And one way of doing it is to construct not directly the surface, but an approximation. I mean, a finer, finer, piecewise linear approximation, or if you want, what is an approximation will be a system of triangulation, a network of points that somehow resemble a surface and that in the limit should give you a surface, right? Okay, how would you do that? Uh, you fix a small parameter h, which means how fine is your construction, and an initial point x0. And then you start from the point, and you want to construct the first cell of your piecewise uh, linear surface, uh, let's say a sort of square. Or So what do you do? You first move from the point x0 in the direction of the first vector field for length h, so h, and then you get the first point. So this will be one of the next point in the grid. Then you start from the second point x1, and you move in the direction of the second vector field, v2, um, again multiplied by h, and you get the third point, uh, x2. But now, of course, you want to construct a surface, so you want to complete the square also on the other side. So you go back to the first point, x0. Now, instead of moving first in the direction of the first vector field, you move in the direction of the second vector field, uh, again multiplied by h, and you get a point x3. And then from x3, you move in the direction of the first vector field by h, and you get a point x4. And of course, it will not happen that the final points x2 and x4 of the two path uh, coincide. There is an error, okay? That's simply because this vector field you are considering are not exactly parallel because they are computed at slightly different points. Okay, so, but let's say that you are happy with the small error. Let's see what happens. Now, how would you keep going to construct a surface? Well, you simply go on, start from the first uh, square, let's say, constructed as before, then you add another one, another one, and so on. You keep adding these squares so that you construct some sort of surface. And now there are, but remember, there was some error in the construction. The error is, in the points which are marked in red, because there, I arrive there by two different paths and I don't get exactly the same point. So let's say this is a construction with error, okay? And this is not a problem in some sense, since you want to take the limit as, goes to, as h goes to zero, in some sense to construct a surface, it's important that the total error will tend to zero as h goes to zero. Where total error means that every node of this network, you, there is an error, and this error accumulates. Okay, so you have to sum them all. Okay, so let's say if I construct a surface of size one, I will have a number of cells which is one over h square. So one over h square is the number of errors, and the sum of these errors must be um, going to zero. So let's go back to the estimate of the error. Okay, let's go back to the previous construction of the basic cell. So we have x0, then I move in the direction of the first vector, and I get x1, I move in the direction of the second vector field, and I get x2. On the other hand, I move up from x0 to in the direction of the second vector field, I get x3, and I move in the direction of the fourth, uh, first vector field, I get x4, and the reason error is the difference between x2 and x4, the two end points. And okay, if you look, this error is just this h times this difference of um, 
values, so is h times v1 computed x3 minus v1 computed x0, minus h times v2 computed x1 minus v2 computed x0. And now if you develop the differences of the vector field v1 at x3 and x2 using Taylor expansion, you get um, h times the derivative of v1 in the direction v2. And vice versa, if you compute the difference by Taylor expansion of v2 computed at x1 and v2 computed at x0, you get um, the h squared times the derivative of v2 in the direction x1. And so if you put them together, you get exactly the commutator times h squared, plus an error due to the Taylor expansion. So essentially, um, this means that the commutator gives exactly the first non-trivial term in the Taylor expansion of the error, okay? Now, let's assume that the commutator is zero, then you get that the error is small o of h squared, okay? It's third order, actually. And then, of course, the total error is h, one over h squared times an error which is small o of h squared, and you get something that goes to zero. And somehow you are constructing a surface. So this has suggests that if the commutator is zero, you can construct a surface by this algorithm. And then you think a little bit, and then you realize that it doesn't mean, it's not important that the error is exactly, um, I mean that the commutator is zero. What is important is that the error is, um, the error makes troubles, only the normal component of the error to the tangent plane is, makes trouble. So, if the x2 and the error is somehow complanar with the surface, who cares? That's not going to count in the end. What really counts is if the error is uh, as a normal component. So it's not important that the commutator is zero, but that the normal component to the tangent is zero, okay? Which is exactly for Benius theorem, if you want. Okay, so um, I decided to say this because I thought that maybe it's useful to say, keep it in mind for the following. Somehow, let's go back to what we have done. Okay, so subsets of surfaces, and um, we want to discuss, I want to discuss subsets, uh, for Benny's theorem for subsets of surfaces. What does it mean? Okay, let's assume that I have a distribution of planes which is not involutive, okay? We have a surface of class C1, and uh, a set which is a contact set for the surface. So I set E in the surface where the surface is tangent to the distribution of plane. Then what is known is that the set E must have empty interior. Fine, because this is the classical case, right? No C1 surfaces can, have, can be tangent to, the, um, to, the vec uh, to a non-involutive distribution. Okay, this is already known. Now the question is, well, if he, the contact set must have empty interior, how large can it be? So the first question, can I have positive area? Okay, so that's the question, okay? The negative answer to this question is what I would call Frobenius theorem, right? Showing that the contact sets not only have empty interior, that we know from the classical Frobenius theorem, but it has zero area. Okay, and then you can ask more. I mean, if it has zero area, you can ask what is the dimension, and that's the, there is an entire story behind that. But let's stick for the moment to this question. Can I have the contact set positive area? Okay, and uh, let's say, when I say for Benio's theorem holds, I mean that it doesn't. Okay, so here are some results. Well, if a surface is of class C11, uh, for Benio's theorem does not uh, holds for every set E. I mean, for surfaces of class C11, um, the contact set must always have zero area. Okay, this is classical. It's um, because it's classical for C2 surfaces, and then Zoltan Balog in 2003 showed that uh, it actually holds. It's a remark. It holds for also C11 surfaces. Okay? Um, the reason why it's classical for C2 is that if you look at the proof of Frobenius theorem, one way of proving it in the negative is that you do a computation which is a pointwise computation involving second derivatives. Okay, so that's why you need C2. So essentially that says something more, in fact, but let's say, let's stick to this statement. So, but there is a corollary I would like to mention of this result that um, 
for C11 surfaces um, for Benio's theorem. Um, so the contact set must have measure zero. And the um, corollary is um, that uh, two rectifiable sets in R3 with the Car Carnot karate ordinary distance are trivial. Um, well, and this holds in general. So now I don't want to explain what this means. It's just a, a corollary. Actually, that's not completely honest. This requires some work. But um, so essentially the point is that uh, this result can be proved using Pansu differentiability theorem, but we can prove it without. Simply for every distribution of plane, we take Carnot karate ordinary theorem for those uh, distance for those who know what it means. And somehow a consequence of the previous result is this. And this two, essentially the key idea, which is not the end of the story, is that uh, you show that if you have a two rectifiable set in, uh, which is two rectifiable with respect to Carnot karate ordinary distance, it's actually covered by C11 surfaces and not just C1 because of the nature of the Carnot karate of the resistance. Okay, so you gain this regularity, and this regularity tells you that this set cannot exist. Okay, so that's a corollary I wanted to mention, because usually this result is um, usually stated, approved using Pansu differentiability theorem. Okay, well, it depends actually on, I think. Okay, now let's go back, forget about that extension. So I said for C11 set uh, surfaces, Frobenius theorem holds for every set. If the surface is less regular than C11, let's say C1 alpha, alpha less than one, then Frobenius theorem fails. Means that you can find surfaces of class C1 alpha, in particular C1, for which you can find sets of positive area where the surface is tangent to the uh, this non-involutive distribution. And this result is again due to Balog. Okay, corollary. There exist non-trivial two rectifiable sets in the space which are tangent to a non-involutive distribution. Now, if you ask yourself what is the difference between this statement and the previous one, is exactly that in the previous statement when I said that there are no non-trivial two rectifiable sets, the distance in R3 was the Carnot karate ordinary distance, while well, here is the Euclidean one, and that makes all the difference in the world, okay? So depending on which distance you consider in the space, rectifiable sets exist or not. But let's go back. So C11, C1 alpha, C1. And what can I say for surfaces of class C1? Is that, okay, Frobenius theorem fails for some sets, but it uh, does not fail if the set has finite perimeter. So if I have a set in a surface S, which has finite perimeter now, I will give the definition in a second. Let's say finite minimum perimeter means that the set may have empty interiors, may have positive area, but in principle has some sort of good boundary. Okay. Now, if it has finite perimeter, then it has to be trivial. So this means that while for C11 surfaces, Frobenius theorem always holds, for C1 surfaces, Frobenius theorem holds, provided we require the set, contact set to have finite perimeter. And okay, this is uh, actually, it's a corollary of two results of Silvano della Dio, who proved uh, somehow you have to put together two results, but um, one proving, okay, I'm not going into details uh, now. Uh, let's simply say that then of course you have an interpolation between the first and third result. So between C11 surfaces where you don't need for Benio's theorem holds with no restriction on the boundary of the set E, and C1 surfaces where uh, for Benio's theorem holds if the set E has finite perimeter, and the, it's an interpolation result, right? It says that if you have a surface of class C1 alpha, alpha between zero and one, then for Benio's theorem holds if the boundary of the set E acts on forms of class C alpha, whatever. Take it as this, if there is an, um, fraction of the boundary, okay? Or if the boundary is a certain negative sublet. But it's, I mean, it doesn't matter. It, view it as an interpolation of results. So it's not like asking that the boundary is nice, is um, uh, that uh, the set has finite perimeter, but it's more than asking that it is an arbitrary set, okay? 
And this is, somehow a, this is a result that uh, we proved with uh, Annalisa and uh, Andrea. Okay, let me give uh, some explanation about these results because this is one of the few results that can be somehow explained without uh, uh, using too much uh, jargon from uh, geometric measure theory. Uh, what does it mean that the distribution boundary of a set, let's say now we are not in a surface, we are in a plane. You have a set in the plane, surface is the same, acts on form of class C alpha. It's a complicated way of saying the following, that if you integrate the differential of a form omega over the set E, um, then uh, the supremum over all uh, omega with C alpha norm less than one, it's finite, okay? Or equivalently, you can state it in terms of vector fields, if you integrate over E the divergence of a vector field phi, then phi, then uh, over uh, the supremum over all phi with the C alpha norm less than one is less than infinity, okay? I mean, it's a technical definition. There is nothing I can do about that, okay? Notice that for alpha equals zero, this condition exactly means that the set has finite perimeter because that supremum there is the so-called perimeter, is by definition the perimeter of the set, okay? So for alpha equals zero also, this condition is implied by the fact that the measure, the length of the boundary is finite. And for alpha between zero and one, it's implied by the fact that the dimension of, um, of the boundary is strictly less than one plus alpha. So okay, what I'm saying is that the set, the boundary has, roughly say, speaking, I'm saying that, um, that the contact set on a C1 alpha surface is trivial as measures as area zero if the dimension is, um, uh, the dimension of the boundary is not too large. And how much large depends on, uh, on the regularity of the surface. If the surface is uh, C11, it's enough that uh, your set, uh, you have no restriction on the dimension of the boundary. Any boundary will be okay. If the surface is of class C1 alpha, then it's enough that the dimension of the boundary is less than one plus alpha, okay? And of course, the lower is alpha, the, uh, the stronger is the restriction you put on the boundary. Okay, so this is a result. I'm not sure that I have time to speak about this. Um, well, <laughs> it's nice to be seen. Okay, let's say I will start with the strategy of the proof. Okay, so what is the idea of the proof? Because this is the only proof that can be easily explained. Uh, let's say that the, the philosophical idea is essentially that finding a surface tangent to a distribution of plane is more or less the same as finding a function on the plane whose gradient is a given vector field. The two problems are related, okay? So, and uh, okay, I will make this statement more precise, okay? So let's say we write R3 as R2 times R, so we choose a particular, um, a plane of reference, which is the horizontal one. Now I assume that the surface S is the graph of a function from the plane from R2 to R, graph of a function of class C1, and that the planes in the distribution are actually have non-trivial projection on this horizontal plane R2. So the, the planes Vx in the distribution are actually uh, the graphs of linear function from R2 to R, and this linear function will be, of course, determined by some vector U of X, capital U of X, okay? And now let's consider the projection of the set E, contact set E, onto the plane, R2. Then in some sense, the fact that E is a contact set means that uh, the set, the for every point in the projection, the gradient of F is equal exactly to the vector capital U, okay? Which, uh, okay, here is the slight things. Um, now it becomes the vector capital U computed at x prime and f x prime. So I would call this small u. And uh, V is non-involutive implies that the uh, curl of u is different than zero, exactly on the set E prime. So this makes a clear connection between the problem of fine, I mean, the problem of surfaces tangent to non-involutive distribution of planes and uh, 
uh, function with the prescribed gradient. It's okay. And somehow then uh, some people might already see where some of the previous results come from. Okay, so let me translate the previous statements about the contact sets in this new language. Okay, so essentially they translate into this statement on for functions in the plane. So let me give a function on the plane of class C1, a vector field in the plane of class C1 with, uh, which is uh, rotational with curl different than zero. Let's take a set, contact set between quotes, then, namely a set where the gradient of F agrees with this vector field, okay. And then, okay, here are the results which translate exactly the previous results. If F is a function of class C11, this contact set E prime must be of measure zero, area zero. And this is an elementary fact for C2 function because now we are talking about, uh, um, about uh, the classical statement on, 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 uh, on the gradient, right? A vector field is a gradient if and only if the curl is zero. I mean, you can do the computation. If the function is of class C11, you can do the computation of the mixed derivatives everywhere and you get exactly that there cannot be a positive area, okay? Then if F is a class C1 alpha, you can have sets of contact of positive, measure, positive area. Okay, this was an old result of mine and of uh, Balog. And uh, if F is called class C1 and the set contact set has finite perimeter, then uh, this cannot happen. That is, the contact set has to be uh, of zero area. And this somehow, this statement, which are statement for function and vector field in the plane are exactly, mirror exactly the previous statement. And uh, okay, so there is not much to say, except what we added new, if uh, the function is of class C1 alpha and the boundary of the sets, contact sets E prime acts on form of class C alpha, then again, the measure of the set has to be zero. It's translation of previous results. So let's say, how do you prove the last two statements that finite perimeter implies measure zero? for the contact set. Well, assume uh, that the set, contact set E prime has finite perimeter in the plane, write the form omega, which is exactly the form associated to the vector field U, so U1 dx1 plus U2 dx2. Then if you apply the boundary of E prime to this form, uh, so to the, sorry, to the differential of F, which is a C1 function, uh, sorry, a C11 function, then this is the same as applying the um, set E prime, integrating the second differential of F on the set E prime, but the second differential of F is zero, so you get zero, okay? On the other hand, integrating um, the form DF and the form omega on the boundary of E prime is exactly the same because um, omega and uh, the differential of F agree on E prime, which contains um, on the set E prime, which contains the support of the boundary, which contains the boundary, let's say, okay? So integrating the F over the boundary of E prime gives zero, but is the same as integrating the F omega on the boundary of E prime. And finally, we notice that integrating om um, omega on the boundary of E prime, that E is an E prime, it's actually the same as integrating D omega on the boundary on E, but this is non zero because this is the integral of the curl. Of, which is non-zero, okay, unless the set E has measure zero, in which case integrating a function which is non-zero gives, um, gives you something different. Okay, well, here there is a glaring mistake that I would punish students, right, heavily for saying something like the integral of a function different than zero must be different than zero. Okay, but you can localize the statement. <laughs> so that's true, <laughs> not, not written in this form. Okay, uh, so the, um, that Mark simply says that, uh, yeah, you have to not take this uh, statement too carefully. Okay, uh, and okay, the same proof works when you have a uh, function of class C alpha, okay? So you have to be simply extra, a little bit more careful, but it's the same proof, it's nothing particularly deep. So you play 
with uh, boundary and integration by parts. This proof contains nothing more than that, okay? So now I will wish to somehow pass to the final part of the talk and talk about and uh, discuss the extension of Frobenius theorem for currents, which for me was somehow the original motivation of what I was really interested in. But okay, uh, it's somehow technical in that it requires a little bit of familiarity with what currents are and terminology, so let's say I decided to keep it for the end. And I will not. So there were two slides introducing currents and notation, and then I decided, no, that makes no sense. So I will, sorry for those who have no idea what I'm talking about, here I will use a little bit of technical terminology. Okay, so I will consider a two-dimensional current in the space with finite mass. This means that it's simply um, current T, which is simply should be viewed as a positive measure times a two-vector field tau, which is, I would call it orientation, okay? And then of course we say, so it's a vector measure if you like. I say that the current is tangent to the distribution of planes if the span of this two-vector field is actually the plane V of X, okay? which in the end boils down to say that this two vector field tau is plus or minus the wedge product of V1 and V2, the vector field that span V, okay? Um, now, if you have a rectifiable current, meaning a current which is uh, where the measure mu is just the restriction of the two dimensional Hausdorff measure to the set E, um, to a rectifiable set E, the previous, uh, the previous um, uh, tangency just means what you expect, that the tangent to the set E is actually the plane at every point, almost every point, okay? So this is more or less what one would expect. Now we assume that V is non-involutive for the rest, and the question becomes, can we find a non-trivial current tangent to V? So this would be failure of Frobenius theorem, okay? Uh, well, negative answer to this question is Frobenius theorem. Positive answer is Frobenius theorem fails, okay? Now, Frobenius theorem does not hold for rectifiable currents. As we already said, you can find a set of positive area on a surface of class C1, which is where the surface is tangent to the, to the um, non-involutive distribution, okay? This is exactly is an example of a rectifiable set, or if you prefer, a rectifiable current, which is tangent non-trivial and tangent to a non-involutive distribution. So that's the basic example, right? And somehow the other statement we ha I had before saying that Frobenius theorem holds if the set has nice perimeter is exactly the point here. So what I'm saying is that um, considering currents with arbitrary boundary does not make sense. What we should consider are currents with nice boundary, okay? because the boundary plays a role in Frobenius theorem. That was exactly the message that I wanted to convey with the previous statement, okay? So let's say that from now on, the current has boundary of finite mass. And here, I'm not going to explain what it means. Let me simply say that currents with boundary of finite mass are called normal currents, and they are, let's say, more geometric than arbitrary currents. In some sense, an arbitrary current, where you put no restriction on the boundary, is something that is just a couple of a measure and the vector field and these two vect vector field and the measure have no relation between them. So there is no geometric relation between the measure and the vector field. Once you require that the boundary is nice, you are somehow making implicitly an assumption on the geometry which connects the structure of the measure and the structure of the orienting vector field tau. Okay, that's somehow hidden in the fact that you are requiring that the boundary is nice. Okay, and that somehow, we already know that the boundary has, must have um, a role in this game, and so in the rest, uh, so here are our results. First, I said Frobenius theorem doesn't hold for rectifiable currents, that is when you don't make any assumption on the boundary, but if you do, like you ask that the uh, current as rectifiable and as finite mass uh, of the boundary, that is, it's an integral current, then it holds. Okay, so for Benio's theorem it holds for integral currents, and the difference is that between integral currents and rectifiable ones is that I'm assuming that the boundary is nice. That's, 
and which, okay, that's what the message I want to convey, okay? I guess it's clear by now. Okay, so this is a result um, we proved with Annalisa um, and uh, Yevgeny. Okay, now here comes what I think is the interesting part. Unfortunately, it's technical, is that Frobenius theorem does not hold for normal currents. I just said the normal currents, currents with finite mass, boundary of finite mass are nice, are geometric. And I'm saying, yeah, but nevertheless, um, Frobenius theorem doesn't hold. And the example is the following one. Take this normal current, the measure is Lebesgue measure in the space. The vector field, the orienting vector field, two vector field is V1 wedge V2, the vector field that spans the non-involutive distribution. And then I put a density row in front of it because I would like to make it finite mass, okay? So just a cutoff function, rho is, doesn't matter, okay? So Lebesgue measure times this vector field, okay? And uh, this is certainly a current, I mean, everything can be smooth, V1, V2, rho, everything is smooth. As you can imagine, this will be a nice current as long as you can integrate things, so that's the reason for the cutoff function. This is certainly a normal current. And Zvorsky, Andrei, Maciej Zvorsky, notice that um, this um, currents, viewed as a current, does not satisfy Frobenius theorem. Okay, so this was his remark pointing out this one. Okay, here is um, a bit of history, why we got interested in this problem in the first place. Um, there is an old story behind this, uh, and it goes back to 87, when uh, somebody asked the following question, somebody, I think it was Frank Morgan, asked the following question. If we have a normal current in general dimension and co-dimension, can we foliate it with integral one? And that was a, with certain assumption. And it was a very good question because in some sense, um, if the answer were yes, that would make a very nice results because it would mean that um, uh, minimizing, uh, solving the plateau problem among integral currents is the same as solving plateau problem among normal currents because you take the minimizer among normal currents and then you foliate and then you get that every foliation will solve the plateau problem uh, for integral currents. But it's actually not just that, it's much better because minimizing normal currents is a convex problem while minimizing integral currents is not convex at all. So this would completely change the perspective from the numerical point of view, for example, right? Of course, too good to be true, right? So in fact, uh, the question is that uh, the question by Frank Morgan has a negative answer. You can't foliate normal currents with integral one. And the first one who pointed out this fact was Maciej Zvorsky, who proposed this normal current, I said, this one cannot be foliated by integral currents. So what's the problem? The problem is that the proof of Zvorsky, while the example is perfectly correct, the proof is completely wrong. To say that, we're using an Italian expression, la buttata in cacciara. That is, he has a lot of pages about huge number of properties of this and that, but in the end, everything relies on a lemma, which is on a lecture notes of uh, Harvey Lawson on geometric measure theory, and these lecture notes never appeared. The lemma, I guess, it's not there, simply. And the result, the fact is, that his proof is wrong because he says, actually, well, I can do better, I can even say that T cannot be decomposed into uh, foliated by rectifiable currents. But now, that was wrong. I knew that this T could be foliated by rectifiable currents, exactly because rectifiable currents tangent to T, to V, exist, okay? So that's where we started, okay? That's the origin of this problem, trying to understand this example. Now, this example is very interesting because this current is very nice, normal, it has it has a very interesting feature. If you look at the boundary, so this current is tangent to your distribution V. If you look at the boundary, the boundary is not tangent to V at all. The boundary is, again, uh, uh, Lebesgue measure times one vector field, and this vector field will be not tangent to V, which is a bit strange, right? We are used to the fact that the tangent to the boundary is contained in the tangent to the surface at the points of the boundary. And this is not true for this current, and actually this seems to be exactly the key property. 
okay, which is, and here is the result somehow, the key property to keep in mind is the following. Um, let's say you have a current t, tau times mu, and let's say that tau is continuous, okay? And then call the boundary, so this is a normal current, call the boundary tau prime times mu prime, write it like it, as before. Then I say, we say, that t has the geometric property of the boundary if the vector orienting the boundary is in the plane spanned by the vector orienting the current. It's, I'm saying that if the tangent to the boundary is contained to the tangent to the surface, which you would assume it's a natural property, but it's not true in general, and that's the previous currents of Zorsky. It's exactly an example of this. And the result, which is a nice result, I think, is exactly the following, that the Frobenius theorem holds for normal currents that has this special property, that the tangent to the boundary is tangent to the surface. Okay, let's call it geometric property of the boundary. Okay, so this makes the difference. This rules out the previous example of Zorsky. Okay, which I call T0 here, but not T0 above, sorry. Okay, now let me conclude, I think, one minute. Um, there is one further thing which is interesting. Um, how general is the example of Zvorsky? So that's an example of normal current which doesn't have the geometric property of the boundary, which um, does not satisfy um, Frobenius theorem, and it's diffuse. So it's a two-dimensional current. I insist, two-dimensional here means as an algebraic meaning. It means that you integrate two forms, right? But it is absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure in the space. So in some sense, as a measure, it's very diffuse, okay? And the question is, I mean, how... Are there other examples? Are there normal currents for which Frobenius theorem does not hold, or the geometric property of the boundary does not hold, which are, let's say, a bit more concentrating than that? And the answer turns out to be no, somehow. Here is the last statement, uh, let me say in words. If you have a normal current tangent to V, non-involutive, in the space, then this current has to be absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure. In fact, has to be of the form of Zvorsky with the, um, well, with the rho, a function which is BV in some Carnot karate of the sense, okay? Well, but has to be of the form above. So essentially it seems that when you um, have three two-dimensional currents that are tangent, their basic dimension, the, measure, the dimension of the measure, underlying measure, must have a skip from two or something larger than two, but could be n, has to become three. So there is a gap in dimension. You can't have examples with a current of dimension, a measure of dimension, say, 2.5. Okay, and this is a very general statement. Now, just a few words. Um, this results, uh, okay, with uh, Annalisa and Yevgeny, we proved this fact in rather generality. And actually, we also proved that this geometric property of the boundary is equivalent to Frobenius theorem. Okay, but what is, and uh, in doing, in this proof somehow, we had to use, uh, um, which is, uh, we had to use the result by um, Guido and uh, Philip Rindler in some essential way. But it seems now that uh, the, the, the question is somehow more interesting because it seems that um, the key point is not having a boundary of finite mass, but again, is having a boundary which is not too bad, meaning acting on forms of class C alpha for some alpha less than one. Okay, so again, you don't need the full boundary for this statement, if we are right, which I've been, I'm not going to guarantee anything like that at the moment. But if we are right, it seems that what matters is not that the boundary has finite mass, but that the boundary is not too bad. Okay, and uh, here there is also some other um, uh, problem that I somehow hide in, the, in, the, in this presentation. When you consider distribution of planes in the space, non-involutive one. In some sense, there is not much to say. I mean that uh, you have this distribution of planes. Once you add the commutators of the vector fields, you get the third dimension that is missing. But when you consider a more general case, uh, the situation becomes a little bit more involved, 
because you could start from a k, k vector fields in Rn, then using the commutators you get some more dimension, but this may not exhaust the process. You might go on adding commutators and commutators, okay? So you don't stop at first order commutators. You might need to add more. And okay, here also there is an issue in that the result we had with uh, Annalisa and the Yevgeny only consider commutator of first order, while it seems, again it seems, that results really depends on the distribution, the full Lie algebra generated by the vector field. But this, it's another story I don't want to enter into details now. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much, Giovanni. Are there questions, comments? Ah, okay. Thank you. Uh, maybe this is just a curiosity. Uh, this is just what uh, you mentioned just in the very end. Uh, uh, could you say something or, so I would like to understand better if something is known about the algebraic structure of the distribution. So how much you can, with this technique, uh, understand something about the role of the non-commutativity? So as you mentioned, you have different degree of non-commutativity and... Okay. It's just a vague You want the uh, answer. Let's try. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, no. Curiosity. Um, let's say, okay. Take, uh, you have a distribution of k planes in Rn. Um, the best results, which we are not completely sure, this result would be with uh, Annalisa and Andrea Merlo, which are not completely sure that it's correct, but if it is, says the following. Take uh, an open set where this, um, the Lie algebra somehow has dimension d, okay? Some dimension less than n and larger than k. Okay, then uh, if you have a current, normal current, well, sorry, current with nice boundary, tangent to this distribution, then it has to be absolutely continuous with respect to the d-dimensional uh, Hausdorff measure, okay? We can prove this if the dimension of the, we can prove, what we proved with Annalisa and Yevgeny Stepanov is that this is true if we consider the set of points where the, the sorry, the algebra generated by, well, the, 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 the vector, the, the, distribution of planes generated by the vector fields and the first order commutators has dimension d, but it, it seems that this is not the correct statement. The correct statement is that uh, you have to consider all commutators and the statement is still true. But again, okay, this has to be taken with care. Any more questions? Seems that there is no question, so thank you again, Giovanni, and we have a coffee break now. Hello, uh, my name is Andrea Marchiodi, and I would like to announce uh, um, a smaller scale uh, event uh, starting uh, from this afternoon uh, at uh, uh, the mathematics department in the main uh, lecture hall. So it's a workshop called uh, Variational Problems, PDEs, uh, and uh, Applications. Uh, so this meeting is, of course, uh, great, but you have Alessio only listening. If you want to hear Alessio speaking, uh, then uh, uh, you can attend this other uh, event. So uh, there is the schedule, and uh, you can find on the web page of the math department a link uh, to this uh, event. So thank you. So we can continue. I'm happy to introduce Guido De Filippis from CISA. He will be giving a talk about fine structures of measures satisfying a PDE constraint. Okay. Thank you very much, Luigi, and thanks all the organizers for the invitation. And uh, okay, so I think I have the duty of closing this meeting, which is quite emotional as I think. Also because I am, I think, the youngest speaker and among all the speakers, the one who met Alessio when Alessio was already an established mathematician. 
because it was my second year of PhD, and he was already professor in, uh, in Austin. So I won't say how much, how brilliant he was as an uh, undergrad or as a graduate student, I can just say how brilliant he was <laughs> as a mathematician. And uh, I mean, what was for me working uh, as a, I'm younger, but not that much younger than him, to, to work with him. So I, I mean, it really has been a, an example for me and uh, a master, both as a mathematician, as we all understood now, well understood how good he is, but mostly as a human being. And there is another thing I would like to add here, which I think is important. So we have been told by many, even foreign colleagues, how the, the Italian community of calculus of variation is linked by bonds of friendships, collaborations, and so on. And that's true. I mean, I'm, I'm part of this community, and it's one of the things I like the most of this community. And uh, if this community is like this, I think we owe this to the people of the community, but most important, to the masters of this community. So how, how we say in Italian is that the, the, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. So I think there is another person here in this room which has to be thanked for this achievement and which has to be congratulated for this achievement and not uh, just for this. So there is one person, I think I would say, who made all of this possible, not just this meeting, which is Luigi sitting here. So, yeah. So the congratulation of all of us goes to Alessio, obviously, but also to Luigi. Okay, so I can pass to the mat side of the conference. Maybe it would be more comfortable. And <laughs> so we talk about fine structure of measures satisfying a PD constraint. And actually, this is a project which I started with a colleague, which is Philip Rindler, but somehow Alessio has been involved also in this project because he was the first person I told the proof. So when I realized the proof, uh, I was able to, to make the proof of the results I'm going to show you. I was in Lyon and Alessio was visiting Lyon, and uh, so it was one night in Lyon, I realized that I was able to do this proof. And the first person I told I, this proof was Alessio, and as usual, half the way I was explaining him the proof, he understood the end of the proof, and he went further. So you say, okay, okay, that's okay, but now let's apply this to this and that. So we never achieve, uh, finished that project, <laughs> so we, we were not able, but I mean, it's again, you never have to stop on what you get, but you have to look further. So that's something we, we learn from him. So. Let me start from what is the general question of my talk and of this project, which is to understand that the fine structure somehow of measures which satisfy a PD constraint. By fine structure, that's pretty much related also to the talk of Giovanni. By fine structure, I mean like dimension, rectifiability, and, and so on. And I will give you some, most of the talk would be to give you some motivation on why we would like to understand this, and then I will present the results. Okay, so let me fix some notation which will be working through all the talk. Uh, so we'll consider a partial differential, uh, a partial differential operator which is linear with constant coefficients. Let's, I'll take it homogeneous of a fixed degree to make things simple. This is not really necessary. And uh, what I would like to stress is this, you see it's like sum of A alpha D alpha, and A alpha are matrices. So in a sense, this gives me a system of differential equation, okay, not just one, really. And the, the things become interesting when you look at systems somehow. And okay, this is the classical notation. So A alpha is a matrix, alpha is a multi-index, and D alpha is the uh, alpha, 
alpha derivative, so it's d1 to the alpha 1 till dd to the alpha dE. So we know that, so everybody says that Alessio, when he started, he didn't know what is a derivative. So I think that in this slide I recall him what's a derivative. <laughs> okay, so to be on the clear side. And since people say that this is quite smart, so I can just pass to the distributional derivative right now. So, <laughs> so I will say that uh, a measure, or more in general, a distribution, is A free. So if it solves the system in the sense of distribution, meaning that every time you test with a test function, then you get that the integral is zero. Okay, there is a dot, which is not supposed to be there. The integral is zero when you test against the unjoint of A star phi. And again, I would like to stress that this is a system of equation. So why one is interested in this type of question? Well, the first remark is that several operators which are relevant in analysis, they are characterized by uh, annihilating a differential constraint. Okay, so by solving a differential constraint. The most stupid example is those, uh, the example of gradients. So you have that a vector field, or so a matrix value at distribution, is a gradient if and only if its curve is zero. Okay, this we know since calculus two. But, and so studying curve-free measure amounts in studying gradients. And there is another relevant uh, operator which is uh, characterized by satisfying a differential constraint, which is the, uh, the, operator, uh, the um, symmetrized gradient operator. So you don't just look to the full gradient, you just look to the symmetric part of the gradient. And uh, actually, if you have a, a symmetric matrix, so a symmetric matrix vector fields so is characterized as a, as a symmetrized gradient if and only if uh, there is this operator which is called Carl Carl, which is zero. So it doesn't matter really what is the, the, the form of this, uh, this operator, uh, but uh, what is important is that there is an operator and which turns out to be second order. So that's another good reason to look to the, to the problem in a full generality somehow. So that's what I was saying. So that studying curve-free measure is the same thing that studying gradients which are measured. So it's the same thing that studying BV function, which are just those functions whose gradient in the distributional sense is actually a distribution of order zero. So it's a measure. And in the same way, studying curve-free measure is the same that uh, uh, studying symmetri uh, symmetrized gradients which are measures, which is the same, the study in the space of BD, which are those functions which the for which the symmetrized gradient is a measure. And this space is uh, strictly larger than BV because of failure of some corner inequality. And it's a relevant space in uh, plasticity. Okay. So there is another very natural uh, differential operator, which is the divergence. And uh, it also appears often in application, and I will mention just a few of them. The first type of application is related to somehow, uh, it comes very naturally when you look to variational problem and you perform what are uh, called uh, inner variations, and I will explain what they are. And in this case, the, the divergence free matrices arises in a very, very natural way. Uh, it, Similarly, I mean, somehow it's the same thing as when you talk about stationary variables, and I will talk a bit about it. And uh, for some even surprising for us reason, there is some link also with uh, the differentiability of Lipschitz function with respect to general measures. So with what is called the converse of Rademacher theorem. Of this, I will not talk at all, but you can ask Giovanni if you, <laughs> if you want. Okay, so <clears throat> let me start by uh, talking about inner variation. So let us consider this variational problem here and let uh, u be the minimizer. So we would like to minimize the integral of f of gradient v, where v is uh, some function which satisfies some sort of boundary 
condition and have uh, some integrands in the calculus of variation, which will have some growth, like p growth, but this is not really relevant. And so say that u is a minimizer. So we know that we can compute Euler-Lagrange equation on minimizers, and there is a, a particular type of Euler-Lagrange equation, which I would like to mention, which are this inner variation. So how does an inner variation work? So now you take a vector field, so a compactly supported vector field in the domain. And uh, out of this vector field, you can construct a family of the diffeomorphism from the domain into itself, which uh, at time zero, say here, it's okay, is the time parameter is played by epsilon, is the identity and that positive, for a positive epsilon is uh, x minus epsilon times this vector field. And now if you consider the function which is u epsilon, which is just u composed with phi epsilon, then you know that u epsilon is a possible competitor since the vector field is uh, compactly supported. My vector field, my diffeomorphisms are all coinciding with the identity, with the boundary of the domain. So whatever boundary condition you put, they're satisfied somehow. And so you know that if you, since u is a minimizer, if you differentiate in epsilon at, and you compute that epsilon equals zero, f of gradient u epsilon, so the energy has to be zero. Now, you made these computations, and uh, what you get is that there is this matrix, which is called the stress tensor somehow, which is in this setting, it can be written as f gradient u times identity minus gradient f and gradient u tensor gradient u, well, this is a divergence-free matrix. And actually, so just for notational purposes, I made this computation. This computation works for function which goes from Rn to R, but it can be done even in a vectorial variational problem. And that they are particularly relevant when you have some constraint, some nonlinear constraint on the target of these maps. Because usually the, the, the way you do uh, perturbation, so Euler-Lagrange equation, is that you add to u epsilon phi for some phi, and this can destroy your constraints somehow, usually. While in this way, you're sure that the image of u epsilon is just contained in the image of u. So if u was satisfying some constraint on the image, that's the same for, for u epsilon. And for instance, just to mention, if you can talk about harmonic maps, which are just maps with values from a domain to some manifold, so they, they are constrained to, to lie in a manifold, and which minimize the uh, gradient v square as any good harmonic map. And in this case, you have that the stress tensor has this form, so it's uh, gradient u square times the identity minus basically gradient u, uh, yeah, it's di is color product with dj, and then you let i and j vary, and this is again divergence free. So you see that somehow divergence-free metrics appear naturally here. And uh, so what is just out of direct computation, that for instance, if f has p growth, then this test tensor has the sides of f gradient u. So now the, the only a priori bound you have on your minimizer or minimizing sequence or whatever is that the energy is finite, which is just gives you that this gradient, this tensor field, is bounded in L1. So now say that you have a sequence of minimizers, uj, with equibounded energies. And then up to subsequence, you can say that your uh, stress tensor, they converge to some measures, because the only bound you have is a bound in L1, and we all know that when you work with uh, sequences which are bounded in L1, the best you can say a priori is that they converge to measures, okay? And, okay, being the divergence a linear operator, what you know about this limiting measure is that it's divergence-free, okay? So this is a situation which appears. And there is another situation which is very geometric and is related to the talk of Francesco Maggi at the beginning of the meeting, which is those of minimal surfaces. So if you take, say, an L-dimensional manifold in uh, uh, Rd, then you can compute the first derivative of the area with respect to the, the same type of vector fields of uh, diffeomorphism I was considering before. So you take a vector field, a compactly supported vector field, then you take phi epsilon, which is just x plus epsilon 
capital X, which is the vector field, and then you look to the manifold, which is phi epsilon of M, you look to its area, or its L-dimensional uh, measure, and you compute derivative. And it turns out that, uh, that this is a precise expression, which is just, you take the gradient of your vector field, and you project it pointwise on the tangent space of your, uh, of your uh, manifold, and then you integrate on the manifold. Okay, and this quantity gives you the, 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 the derivative of the area. So you say that the surface is minimal if it has zero derivative of the area with respect to all of this perturbation. So in other words, if these measures, which is the measure which is the projection measure on the, uh, on the tangent space times the measures of the, of the manifold, so the volume measure restricted to the manifold, well, this measure is divergence-free. Now, again, a natural question would be, okay, say that I have a sequence of minimal surfaces, or almost minimal surfaces in some sense, with, say, bound, equibounded area, what can I say? Again, I know that the measure, that the volume measure associated to them, so this HL, sorry, should be restricted to mj as some weak limit in the sense of measure up to subsequence. So what can I say about this weak limit? How much would this weak limit, for instance, resemble a surface? Right? A priori, you can get a lot of possible uh, limiting measures out of this construction, but how this uh, constraint of being minimal plays a role. And uh, it's not hard to show, that's basically abstract functional analysis, that uh, under the, uh, the above assumption, then you can find a, a, a matrix valued vector field, P, such that the divergence of P times mu is zero. And this P should be taught as the limit of those projection in the case of uh, minimal surface. But again, when, when you make a limit in this very weak sense, you cannot be sure that you have some sort of pointwise convergence, and actually what happens is a sort of measure young type convergence. So this vector field P is not given by a projection, but is given by an average of projection, pointwise. So this P is an average with respect, so it's pointwise an average with respect to some probability measures, which you, you don't know, you just know it exists, of orthogonal projections, okay? And somehow I will call, it's not really the classical definition, but should be equivalent, I will call the couple mu, the couple of measures, so mu, which is my limiting of the, the area measures, and mu x, which is this measure which is giving me pointwise how to average this projection, I will call this a L-dimensional stationary variable. And the very same thing can be done if instead of looking to the area, you look to some different type of energies, as the one which Aldo was mentioning at, uh, in his talk on Monday, where uh, uh, the, the, the surface tension depends on the orientation of the, of the tangent plane. So these, are, for instance, they appear naturally when you, when you try to model crystals. Okay, so there are some preferred directions. So your, uh, your energy is the integral over m, not just uh, of one, but of some function of the tangent space. And you can sort of make all the, what uh, I did for the area, and see that uh, these times you don't get orthogonal projection, but you get some sort of oblique projection, which are determined by f. And uh, you can build the same machinery, and this gives you the notion of f stationary variables, okay? So you see that it's uh, quite natural to, to look to measure. So I mean, th this part was to convince you that looking to measures which satisfy a differential constraint can, can give you, I mean, it, it's covering a lot of somehow interesting situation. So I, I won't talk about converse of Rademacher theorem, but we have the expert. Okay, so let's go back to this general question of what can we say about a measure which is satisfying a differential constraint? I mean, how is the, this differential constraint acting on this measure. So what is telling us about this measure? Okay, so this is just to, to fix some other general notation. So we know that a measure, so this is just uh, Radon-Nicodym theorem, 
that a measure, so this is, remember, these are vector valued measures, it can be written as some fixed vector, uh, so some, some vector which is d mu over the total variation of mu times the scalar measures, okay? This is not thing deep, again, it's just uh, the back differentiation theorem, but somehow you can split the part which on the, the scalar part of the measure, which is even positive, this is total variation measure whose definition I recall just here. So, and uh, this vector, which I would call a polar vector, which is telling you what, what is the direction of this measure. And then you can further decompose this, me this, uh, this measure as a part which is absolutely continuous, which respects, say, to the Lebesgue measure, and the part which is uh, singular with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Okay? And okay, so mu is the total variation measure, and mu s will be the part which is singular with respect to the Lebesgue measures. And uh, that's recalling you what is the definition of a total variation, which is not really important right now. Okay, <clears throat> so the first, okay, let's say that we know what it is. Uh, the absolutely continuous part, which is actually not that true. And the question is, what can we say about the singular part of this measure? Let's at least start with this. And this is the first result, which we obtained some years ago with Philip Rindler. So the result was obtained, actually was obtained late 15, when I was in Lyon, and I, that's the proof I told Alessio on the blackboard in the morning. <laughs> Uh, but it appeared in uh, 2016. So if you have an A-free measure, mu, then its polar vector at almost all singular points is constrained to lie in what is called the uh, wave cone associated to the differential operator. So for mu singular almost all points, d mu over d mu has to lie in this cone, and the cone is defined to be as the union of the kernel of the symbol of the operator. So you have this operator, then you know how to build a symbol, you just basically Fourier transform this operator, so the symbol is xi, which is just the sum of, besides some irrelevant factor, is the sum of a alpha xi alpha, where xi alpha is just a polynomial, and this, this is a matrix, right? I mean, your averaging matrix, it as a kernel, and then you take the union of all these kernels, okay, when xi is non-zero, because if xi is zero, this guy is the zero matrix, so the kernel is everything, and the union is not so interesting. And, uh, okay, so why shall I expect that this wave cone plays a role? So this, actually, this wave cone is not something new. It has been introduced by Murat and, and Tartar in the 70s, and uh, it, was, uh, in the, it was introduced in a slightly different context, which is the context of compensated compactness. And so for people working in micro-local analysis, this might look somehow very similar to what is called the wavefront sets. Uh, this is not really the case, because I would like to stress that this guy War, uh, lives in the target space, so in the image space, while the wavefront set is something which lives in the domain space or in the dual space of it, so in the Fourier space. So this is somehow something which is related to, to, to the target, and that's why it, it becomes quite relevant when you talk about vector valued things. Okay, you, you can build it also for scalar valued, but just for vector valued things which you see some structure, and uh, somehow, the, to, to understand it, let me say that and the, the rough definition is the following. It contains the amplitude along which the system fails to be elliptic, right? So for, for a general, for a, for a scalar valued uh, system, uh, so, so for a scalar valued equation, say with constant coefficient, basically, either you are elliptic or you are not. So the symbol can be either zero or not. While here, the symbol can be zero in, cer well, in, in certain direction or non-zero in certain direction. And those direction along which is zero is those di the direction which are in the wave cone. 
So a way to say this is that, for instance, you have an amplitude lives in the wave cone. If you can find some non-zero psi such that the one-dimensional one-direction function lambda times h of x dot psi is a free, no matter what h is. So you see that this is a complete failure of ellipticity. So we don't know what ellipticity is, but for sure ellipticity should prevent you to be bad. Okay, at least whatever is your definition, it should give you something. And this is, doesn't give you, if you are in direction of lambda, there is really no control on the, how an A free measure or a free distribution can be in that direction. So H can be any function or any distribution. You can do the contrapositives and say that lambda is not in the wave cone if when you look to the operator, which now is taking scalar value at the function and, uh, and gives you by, so this operator is called B lambda, which takes scalar value at function and uh, is defined on this function as A of lambda V. So you're basically restricting your operator to function whose image lines parallel to lambda in the, in the line with direction lambda. Well, now this operator is elliptic, say, in the classical set. So it has a symbol which does not vanish. Okay, so really the, the wave code encodes the failure of ellipticity somehow in the target space of your operator. That's a bit the philosophy. And so you expect that some, if some bad behavior of your solution appears, like being singular, it has to appear in these directions. And that's somehow the, 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 the heuristic uh, explanation of, of our results. Okay, so, okay, we know that the singular part is constrained to, to, to lie in this wave cone, but this is not the end of the story because somehow you can ask yourself if there is some, some, some sort of stratification of, of this type of, uh, of result. So we know what happens when, when the singular, so on this part which is singular with respect to the Lebesgue measure, but there are several type of measures which are singular with respect to the, let, the, the Delbeck measure, and uh, somehow we, you can ask yourself if there is a more fine tuning of this fact. So can I say something on the part of my measure which is, say, singular with respect to some L-dimensional measure? So it has to be more concentrated than L-dimensional measure, right? So say that you are working in R3, so okay, you know that if you are not as diffuse as R3, something is happening on your uh, polar vector, but say that you know that you are uh, less diffuse than uh, some surface type measure, some H2. Can you say something more? Can, can you be even like, for instance, more uh, singular with respect to H1? So you see that there is a whole uh, scale of uh, measures that you could put there and uh, ask yourself if you can say something. And there are examples in which you see that something is happening. For instance, this, I will come to this later. Most of you know that gradients are absolutely continuous with respect to Hn minus one. So is there a way to, to see this out of this structure? Our, our theorem is not telling this right now. Okay. And uh, to, to see this, to, to get this fine uh, structure, let me introduce Another family of cones, which I will call, we called L-wave cones. So an L-wave cone is just uh, somehow the intersection, so on all L-dimensional planes, of the wave cone of the operator restricted to that uh, plane. Okay, so you just look to the union on all psi living in that plane, and which are not zero because otherwise things become trivial, of the kernel of xi, so this gives you some, somehow a cone, and then you intersect on all planes, okay? So uh, I mean, out of the definition, you get a stratification in cones, so the L dimensional cones is smaller than the L plus one dimensional cone, so the, the biggest one is my wave cone, and the smallest one is just the intersection of all the kernel of my symbols, okay? And uh, as I was saying, uh, okay, here is missing a word, elliptic, uh, that, uh, no, that's, that's correct. So as I was saying, the, an amplitude lambda is uh, in the, 
as in the L-dimensional wave gone, if and only if there is a plane, uh, for all planes pi, lambda is the wave cone of the operator restricted to pi, whereby the operator restricted to pi, I just mean the operator which takes a function phi, which is defined on the plane, and somehow uh, acts on this function as the full operator act on the function in which you forget the variable which are not in pi. So you look to this function, so it's defined on a plane, say in R3, you think to this function as defined in the wall R3, just constant in the other direction, and you let the operator act on them. And this is how A restricted to pi acts, okay? And the result we have obtained recently together with Adolfo Arroyo Rabaza, uh, Philip and Jonas Hirsch, so uh, Adolfo is a postdoc in Warwick and Jonas, we have seen his name already in the talk of Camilla, was a uh, postdoc, now, now he's in Leipzig, but he was a postdoc with me. And the, the result is the following. So if you have an A free measure, and you take a set E, which is H L null for some L. So somehow it's a set which, like, uh, H L is more fine than, than the full dimensional measure. Well, on that set, for almost all, new almost all point of that set, the polar has to lie in the L dimensional wave cone. So the more singular is the measure, the more the, the polar is constrained. Okay? And note that if you do this with L equal D, then you recover the result with Philip. Because if you have an H E null set, then I say mu almost all x in E is the same that saying mu s almost all x in E, if E is Lebesgue null, because the absolutely continuous part doesn't play any role on that set. Okay. So actually, the, the result is slightly more fine than this, and uh, it's not just more fine because we wanted to be more fine, but <laughs> because it really comes naturally in the proof, and we can look to a measure which is slightly more, well, slightly, quite more refined than the Hausdorff L-dimensional measure, and this is what is called the integral geometric measure. So I won't give you the precise definition of the integral geometric measure, but for the purpose of the talk, you can think that this is the following, so this is what I wrote. You take a set E, then you project it on a L-dimensional plane. Now you look to the, its measure in that plane, so it's Lebesgue measure in that plane, okay? And then you average on all the planes, okay? where you average with respect to the only natural measure you can put on the space of planes. Okay? And, okay, this, if I give you the definition like this, this doesn't give you a measure, but uh, since I will be interested just in null set, it gives you the same null sets. So, uh, so basically, you have to think that a set, so what's important is our null sets, right? So a set as uh, integral geometric measure zero, if and only if, its projection on most, almost all L planes is zero, okay? So it's a set that you cannot see if you just project it. You cannot see him from his shadow somehow. It might exist, but you don't see him through its shadow. So it's a sort of ghost set living there. And as I was saying, so if you have a set which is HL null, so the projection will be HL null as well, so the integral will be null. And so this measure is more fine than the L-dimensional measure. So it's absolutely continuous with respect to the L-dimensional measure. But what is important is that there are sets for which the L-dimensional measure is positive, but the integral geometric measure is zero. And somehow these sets are even characterized by a very deep theorem of Bezikovich Federer. So take a set which is, okay, it has to have a finite L-dimensional measure. And then this set as integral geometric measure zero, if and only if, uh, is what is said purely unrectifiable, meaning that every time you intersect in with a L-dimensional manifold, then you don't see nothing, okay? So this is a characterization of what are called purely unrectifiable sets, which should be somehow, by the name at least, 
orthogonal to rectifiable sets. Okay, and uh, so let's, uh, so already Giovanni was speaking about rectifiable sets. There are a lot of definitions of rectifiable sets. One of my favorite is the following. So a set is rectifiable if up to a small error, an error as small as you wish, you can find an L-dimensional manifold which cover almost all this set. Okay, so if there is an L-dimensional manifold such that the L-dimensional measure of E symmetric difference with this Manifold is less than epsilon, okay? This is, I think, it's not the, the, the definition we usually use, but I think it's one of the most clear definition of rectifiable sets. And so, it's somehow, bezikovich federer theorem is a good criterion to see if you have an, uh, if a set is uh, uh, rectifiable. Okay, so what are, uh, let me start giving you a couple of corollary of the result with Adolfo, Jonas, and Philip. Well, say that for some reason, you can, com I mean, the, these L-dimensional cones, they are not so hard to compute. Okay, depends how, how good you are in doing linear algebra computation, so for me they are a complete mess, but uh, they are not so hard, and in principle it's like something which should take you finite time, more or less. So say that you know that your L-dimensional cone is zero for some reason, okay? They, they are uh, one smaller than the other, so I mean the, the smallest has more probability to be zero than the highest. Then every time you have an A-free measure, well then this measure has to be absolutely continuous with respect to the uh, integral geometrical measure because otherwise on that part which is singular, you will see uh, a polar vector, which a non-trivial one, so this polar vector is always like a unit vector which has to lie in this cone, but this cone is empty. I mean, it has zero because zero has to be there, but there is nothing besides zero. And so, so you have to be absolutely continuous with respect to the integral geometric measure, and then in particular, yeah, yeah there is another typo, in particular with respect to the HL measure, twice. <laughs> Okay, so in particular, the dimension of all A free measures should be at least L, where the dimension of a measure, I, mean, I don't give you, I'm not giving you here the definition, but somehow it's not really relevant what is the definition. Well, maybe, yeah, but, but say that uh, I, it should be like, for instance, the, the biggest, uh, the smallest, uh, uh, the biggest L such that it is absolutely continuous with respect to HL, for instance. The, okay, so it's at least L-dimensional somehow. That's what I would like to, to convey. And now it's even better because you can say that uh, since you have bezikovich federer theorem, which gives you some, uh, uh, some criterion for rectifiability, you can say that if the L-dimensional uh, wave cone is zero, and you have an A-free measure, then the part which is L-dimensional, so the real L-dimensional part, has to be rectifiable. So it cannot live on a set which is invisible by all projection, and we know that these sets are just the purely rectifiable, uh, purely rectifiable sets. So you have a very, so a way to, to, to select the L-dimensional part of a measure is to look to its density. So you just look to the ratio of the measure of the ball with respect to the measure of the L-dimensional ball. If this density is finite, then this is the L-dimensional part. So imagine, for instance, that L is less than the dimension and your measure is Lebesgue, right? So the measure of the ball will be, goes like R to the D, so L is less, so R to the D over R to the L gives you zero. Uh, yes which is okay. No. <laughs> uh, imagine that you are more singular with respect to, imagine that you are more singular with respect to, to an L-dimensional measure, instead you will see infinity there. So this, this gives you somehow the, allows you to, to, to see what is the L-dimensional part of the measure, and uh, this L-dimensional part has to live on a, on a rectifiable set. So let me give you a couple of corollary of this corollaries. So this is corollary square. So if you have, let's look what happens for the car. Uh, then you can compute what is the kernel of the car, which is just A tensor Xi. 
Uh, so just if, if you fix the frequency xi, so these are just those metrics of the form A tensor xi, so a rank one matrix in which the first, say, uh, part is given by xi. So for instance, if you compute the wave cone, the full wave cone of the curl, you get just uh, a rank one matrix, while if you compute the d minus one dimensional cone of the curl, you get, uh, you get zero. And now as a corollary, you get, uh, for function in BV, first of all, you get that for singular, uh, this is was a corollary of the, the theorem with Philip, that for m almost all singular parts, the gradient of a BV function, a singular point has to be of rank one, and this is a result which was proved by Giovanni 25 years ago, more or less. <laughs> and that, that recently there has been a new proof by David and Alisa, so. <laughs> All this row is about <laughs> rank one theorem, which is a very nice and short proof. Uh, but it's, uh, it comes also from our, uh, from our result. And another consequence is that gradients are absolutely continuous with respect to the d minus one dimensional measure. And what is the real d minus one uh, part is uh, rectifiable. Okay? So this is known for BV function. It has been proved obviously, by, by Federer and then reviewed by so in the book of Luigi with uh, Pallare and Fusco. It has developed fully. But uh, this is somehow, I mean, you can see it is also from this other point of view. And uh, another result you can see from this point of view is what concerns symmetrized gradient. So these times. The, car, the care of the car carl operator, which is this operator which just can spot with symmetrized gradient, is given not by tensor products, but by symmetrized tensor products. So the full wave cone are uh, all those symmetrized tensor products, and the d minus one uh, cone is zero as well. So you get uh, that for a for the symmetric part of the gradient of a BD function, first of all, you have the analogous of Giovanni's rank one theorem. And second, you get another result, which I think is due to the uh, PhD thesis of Kohn, and that has been revised ago also by Luigi Cosce Dalmaso, which is that the symmetrized part of the gradient has to be absolutely continuous with respect to d minus one dimension. And it has that the d minus one dimensional part is actually rectifiable. Okay. And then there are some consequences also for stationary varifolds. So take an L dimensional stationary varifold, which I remember use this couple of measures in which if you average the projections with respect to this new x measure, you get the, the matrix P mu as divergence zero. And now, since this matrix P is an average of L-dimensional projection, it's not hard to see that the dimension of its kernel has to be at most D minus L. So you cannot increase the dimension of the kernel when you average positive projections, okay? So everyone has any L-dimensional projection as a kernel which is D minus L-dimensional, and when you average it out, you just decrease this fact. And now, if you look to the divergence operator, and you compute what is its kernel, xi by xi, are just those metrics for which xi is in the kernel of M. Which means that if you look to the L-dimensional wave cone of the divergence, well then it's, you have to play a bit with union and intersection, but it's such that the dimension of the kernel is at least d minus L plus one. Okay? And now you see that, okay, a priori, this is never empty for the divergence. I mean, if I just look to the divergence operator, this, this cone is never empty, uh, up to, unless you get to zero, to the zero one, so the, the most fine one. But there, there, is, there are always uh, possible cones, which is, you, I mean, this is related to the well-known fact that if you take a curve and you look at the vector value of the measure, the measure which is related, which is just the measure on this curve times the, the, the tangent vector of this curve, then you get, let's say, a closed curve, then you get a divergent free measure. So you have to see something which is one dimensional. But say, if for some reason, coming from somewhere, 
you know that your matrix has some constraint on uh, its rank or the dimension of its kernel, well, then you can apply our theorem. And in the case of stationary variable, you see that, okay, the L-dimensional cone of the divergence is not zero, but my matrix cannot take value there. Okay, so for those type of measure, you know that they have to be absolutely continuous with respect to HL, and that the L-dimensional part is rectifiable. So I think that all this minus inf less than plus infinity should be positive, bigger than zero. But yeah, sorry for the <laughs> spreading typo for, <laughs> for the whole talk. And uh, so this thing recovers what is known in the theory of uh, stationary variefold as Allers rectifiability theorem, which has been proved by a completely different way and actually allows to extend, so okay, we, we are just recovering theorem, which might be not so interesting, but for instance, in this case, this allows you to, uh, to extend this theory of, uh, station, of rectifiability of stationary variable to variable which are stationary with respect to different integrants. Okay, so not just for the, with respect to the area. And actually, the, the, the original proof of Allard was, it's impossible to extend to this type of, uh, of integrants. And uh, so this was done in, somehow in between the two, to, to the two papers by myself with uh, Antonio De Rosa, which should be is there, and Francesco Giraldin. And actually, it's somehow we introduce some ideas there, which are those which we use for this theorem with Adolfo, Jonas, and Philip. And okay, as we was saying, it allows to recover. Uh, by similar arguments and a little bit of regularity theory, one also recovered a quite famous result of Fangualin, which was proved also by Ambrosio and Sonner, about the, uh, somehow about the rectifiability of the defect measure for sequence of harmonic functions. So say that you have a sequence of uh, harmonic functions uh, with equibounded energies, then, oh, sorry, there is a square missing here. Uh, so then you know that the, the energy, so the, 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 say the density of energy, so it will be du square times dx, so there is a square missing here, sorry. They will converge as, as, as measure to some measure mu, well then, out of regularity theory, you can prove that this measure mu has to be just singular with respect to the, I mean, it has to be d minus two dimensional somehow. And what, the, what was proved by, by Fangua with relying on the ideas of uh, Luigi and Sonner is that this measure is concentrated on a d minus two rectifiable set. And uh, this is actually, uh, this is actually a consequence of, uh, of our theorem. So you, you see what is the structure of the matrix appearing in the, in the inner variation. You, in the limit, you get something which should be like uh, an average of those type of matrix, and then you compute what can be at most the dimension of the kernel of, this, uh, of these matrices, and then it's just an algebraic fact that you recover this theorem. Okay. Uh, okay, so I think I'm a bit late in time. So I won't give you probably the proof of these results, but uh, I would like to, so it seems that the theorem is nice and it's recovering, well, at least to me, I like it. And it's recovering some uh, known results, but actually I would like, I mean, we have to be honest. So the theorem is not optimal. It's very likely not optimal. And I would like to give you what I believe should be the optimal version of the theorem, which right now is just a conjecture. So take this A3 measure mu and assume it is just a rectifiable part, okay? So I can write this as lambda x, which is my polar, times HL restricted to some L-dimensional rectifiable set. Then this is an A3 measure, and then I can do some sort of classical uh, blow-up techniques to get that, uh, then I get, so I 
typical points, I can blow it up. So a rectifiable set shell looks like a manifold. So when I blow it up, I get the plane, which is this tangent plane, which I call pi zero here. And then the polar vector somehow frees. So I have a measure, which is just a fixed polar vector times the HL measure is to a plane. Okay? And since my operator was linear, homogeneous, constant coefficients, I can easily blow it up and get that this measure has to be a free as well, as the one I was started with. And now I just compute what does it mean. And I just, for instance, take Fourier transform of the fact that A nu has to be zero. And I compute this is in a frequency xi. And then by, by the very definition of symbol, what I get is a xi applied to the Fourier transform of nu. And uh, the Fourier transform, so lambda of x0 is constant. So I'm taking Fourier, uh, I, when I Fourier tra transform it, I just get the same, very same constant. And then if you Fourier transform the, the measure restricted to a plane, then what you get is the measure, the d minus l dimensional measure restricted to the perpendicular plane. That's just an exercise. So these things is telling you that a xi times so these things can be zero, either if it's zero the first part or if it's zero the measure. So what you get is that a xi applied to this fixed polar vector has to be zero for all xi which are in the perpendicular direction of my plane pi zero. So this tells me that maybe I can define this family of cone, which I call sort of n, because they should remind you that are normal cone which is just the union on all L planes in the Glassmannian of the intersection on the perpendicular of the kernel of the symbol. And this, yeah, this K here is another typo, sorry. So it's just a symbol, okay? If I have a non-homogeneous operator, it would be just the k homogeneous part of the operator. I'm not talking about it. Okay, and then uh, you play a bit with linear algebra and you see that, okay, this is again a family of cones which is, uh, uh, which is contained one in the other, and the L dimension, the normal L dimensional cone is contained in my L dimensional cone, L plus one dimensional cone. Okay, just play with definitions, and uh, and you get this, and now you see that our computation gives me that if I know that my measure lives on an L dimensional set, then the polar has to belongs to this L dimensional normal cone. Okay, so I can define this, so in particular it has to be non-zero, and this, oh, sorry for all this time. <laughs> and so I can take the minimum L such that this normal L-dimensional cone is non-zero, which is bigger, by in my previous inclusion, of the biggest L such that the other one is zero, so the L-dimensional cone is zero, and uh, for, that's, uh, Easy to see that for first order operators, these two quantities, they, they do coincide. They even do coincide when the d minus one dimensional cone is zero because there is no space. But you can build operators. So we, we have an operator, which is a third order, maybe not so interesting, but there are operators for which these quantities are different. And uh, as I was saying, so our theorem is saying that mu, an A free measure mu should be absolutely continuous with respect to H L star, but the conjecture will be that this has to be absolutely continuous with respect to H L star star plus one. Uh, yes. Okay. So, so in a sense, it has to be absolutely continuous with respect to. Uh, no, it's H L star star. Sorry. It has to be absolutely continuous with respect to the to some bigger uh, measure. And when, I mean, the known example, you don't see this because these two numbers in, this, in that example, they do coincide. But uh, there are examples where we know that these two numbers do not coincide and actually we don't, uh, we don't even know in that example. We have not been able to prove in that example the conjecture is true actually, but it seems to us the most natural conjecture. And uh, let me say that if the conjecture is true, then the bound on the dimension would be optimal. Because if you have the, the, uh, the, N, uh, the normal L-dimensional cone is non-empty, you can always construct an A3 measure of that 
dimension. Okay, and that's just by reversing the computation I did. Take a fixed plane and a fixed direction. Okay, so I think there is no time to give you a hint of the proof. And there is, however, sometimes to give congratulations to Alessio and uh, to thank you all. So thank you very much, Guido, also for your very nice words. Very appreciated. <laughs> and uh, are there questions, comments? Thank you. Um, so I think that among the results that it would follow from your last theorem is also this fact that it's uh, the equivalent of, uh, of um, your statement for varifolds for currents. If you have a current which is k-dimensional, but the orientating uh, k-field is not simple, and indeed the span of this orientating k-field is, let's say, d-dimensional, d larger than k, then the current has to be absolutely continuous with respect to hd and not just hk yes so it has to be more diffuse simply because in the tangent there are more yeah. direction roughly seems to be the same now the question becomes the following in that case that statement you can prove by projections do somehow projection or slicing play a role in the proof of your statement yes yeah <laughs> yeah, <I didn't. laughs> yeah basically and that's why the uh, integral geometric measure is somehow the the right one. So in a sense, you would like to say, okay, take this bad set, restrict the measure to this bad set, project, and you get an A-free measure, which is singular on the, on the project set. Uh, that's what you would like to do. Unfortunately, when you restrict the measure on a set, then it's not A-free anymore. If the set is not open, then there is a, but it's somehow A-free to the highest order. And now you have to, to deal with What's the reminder? And again, there is this Fourier multiplier issues that the reminder is going to zero in L1, but then you need to, I mean, when, when you apply a calderon zygmunt operator to L1, you don't end up in L1. But yeah, we, we understood how to do this with Philip uh, three years ago, and then um, it's worth it now. Any more questions? Okay, so if not, uh, I thank you, all of you, for participating, and uh, I hope you will be able to attend the analytic continuation of this meeting this afternoon, and uh, again, congratulations to Alessio. So, yeah, so if I may, just again, I would like to thank again all the speakers. I mean, this would not have been possible with... Um, Without them, uh, they're all friends. Um, also, again, this award is not only for me. I mean, you know, mathematics is not just an individual process. You do it with many people. Some are become your masters, some become your collaborators, some are your students, and you learn from everyone. So, um, thank again to the speakers, thank Luigi, thanks to the organizers, and thank to all the participants for coming here. Uh, you made this event uh, very emotional to me, so. Thank you.